So we're continuing on, of course, tonight, 1 Samuel chapter 3. We'll get right into it. It says in verse 1, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord in those, uh, was precious in those days. There was no open vision. So right out of the gate, we're getting a very, uh, you know, very sad uh, picture of the poor spiritual state that Israel is in at this time. And if you recall, we're coming out of the time of the Judges. And if you go back to Judges and read the last verse, of the last chapter of that book, it says that there was no king in Israel and that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know, and that's a sad state of affairs. Nothing good happens when people get to a place in, their, in, in a society where they do whatever they think is right in their own eyes and they don't allow the word of God to tell them what's right and what's wrong. And of course, that's what we see here. The, Lord, the word of the Lord was precious in those days. I mean, of course, that the word of God was not being uh, revealed unto anybody. There was no open vision. We have to remember that Back then, the word was be given by direct revelation. You know, they didn't have all 66 books of the Bible. You know, they didn't even have the entire New Testament at that time. They had, you know, the words of Moses, and that was it. So at that time, of course, as we read through the Old Testament, we see prophet after prophet after prophet saying, Thus saith the Lord, and speaking the words of God. That's how God spoke back then. That's how God revealed himself, was through the direct revelation to specific prophets. You know, and that... And we see that in Hebrews chapter 1. And if you would, go over to Exodus chapter 27, but keep something, of course, 1 Samuel 3, and go to Exodus 27. The Bible says in Hebrews 1, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. So in times past, God spake unto the fathers by the prophets. That's how God revealed himself back then. But it says in verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So God has changed the way that he communicates with man now. He came with, with in, in the, in the Lord came, the Lord Jesus Christ, and of course he spake, that was God communicating to man. And then after that, after he went up and ascended back into heaven, you know, he gave us his holy word. You know, the holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And these things were written down, they're written for our admonition. This is how God communicates to us today. There is no special revelation from God. You know, anybody gets up and says, you know, I've got a, I've got a word from the Lord. It better be King James Bible or the, equivalently in your, the equivalency in your language. You know, you better, be, you better be giving me, you know, chapter and verse. And don't give me some new revelation. Because that's not how God speaks to us anymore. God speaks to us through this word. And it's funny that people, you know, they want that. They, they want so bad, they want to hear some new thing. They want, you know, they want to have some, you know, special revelation from God. They want to feel like God's speaking just to them. But they don't want to read this book. Right. You know, God has said a lot right here. I mean, God has said so many things, and you could read it all and read it again and read it again, and God will speak to you when you read the word. That's how God reveals himself today <clears throat> is through his word. But back then in Samuel's day, of course, he was revealing them through the prophets, through men like Samuel, the high priest, and others. And that's, of course, why you see those Old Testament warnings about false prophets. And, of course, uh, you know, we could, we could go on and on about that, but we're not going to. But, you know, God would condemn false prophets because back then, you know, that's how, you know, God would speak to people was through prophets and preachers. So that's why we got into all those different judgments on those that would bring a false uh, prophecy, those that would lie in the name of the Lord. <coughs> but what we see here in the beginning of 1 Samuel, I don't want to get into all that, is, is the, it kind of get into the, 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 the spiritual state of affairs in the nation of Israel. It's quite sad. There's no open vision. It goes on and says in uh, Exodus, or no, excuse me, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 2, and it came to pass that when Eli was laid down in his place, his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep. And I've preached a sermon about these verses before called A Shadow and Shiloh. And it reminded me, every time I read this, you kind of get this, sometimes the Bible just paints a picture you know, of what's going on spiritually. And what do you see? You see there's no vision. right? People are losing their vision. You can't, there's no sight. You see this man, Eli, the man of God, He's laid down. His eyes are waxing dim. He could not see. There's no vision. And it says the lamp of God, you know, the light of God is going out. And what you see is this darkness has crept over this land, spiritually speaking. Of course, these are all very literal things as well. So <coughs> we see here that really up to this point in the chapter, you know, it's a sad state of affairs. And there's really, there's no hope for the future up to this point. I mean, Eli, his, his eyes are waxed dim. You know, he cannot see. Eli, the man of God, is incapable of even fulfilling his duties as the priest. You know, we, you know, get in, we won't get it there just yet, but if you remember in, in, uh, next week, you'll see where it says that Eli, 
you know, he wasn't, his eyes weren't waxing dim because he was sleepy. It's because he was a very old man. I believe he was like 98 years old. And his eyes had actually, people had to tell him that the ark had been taken. He couldn't even see what was going on. He had to ask somebody, you know, hey, what's happening here? And um, because of the fact that he was going blind. And part of his duties there in verse 3 are, and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. Now, if you're there in Exodus chapter 27, look at verse 20. It says, And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. In the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever under their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. So it was Aaron, the high priests, and his sons, and his, those that would follow after him, was their duty to keep that lamp lit. That lamp was not supposed to go out. But what we see here in 1 Samuel chapter 3 is that they got in the place where the man of God has become blind. He's gotten so old, he can't even fulfill his duties. You know, we, we rip on Eli, and rightly so, he deserves the criticisms that he gets, but I believe there are also some good things about Eli, too, and we can't fault him, I believe, for every little thing that happened. But Eli here, you know, it might even been his heart's desire that that lamp stay lit. But, you know, he's just so old and so blind, he can't even fulfill his duties as a priest. <laughs> you know, and that, that means, you know, it would have fell on his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. You know, they were young, able-bodied men that, why isn't this lamp lit? Well, of course, we know it's because they're, you know, children of, uh, children of the devil. They're sons of Belial. They're reprobates. They could care less about the lamp. They could care less about it. So that's where they're at in this story. The children of Israel, of course, you know, they're doing their part, right? It says there in Exodus 20, command the children of Israel that they bring the oil, the pure oil, uh, all of beaten. And so it's not that they're not bringing the sacrifices and the, it, it can't get done. It's just that there's no one there to do the work. The man of God is failing, and he's failed to raise his sons right so that they could uh, do their part. It's leadership that is failing at this time. And it goes to show you that it, everything rises and falls on leadership. Why is it that every man was doing that which is right in his own eyes? Because there was no leadership. There was no one getting up and saying, thus saying the Lord. You know, there was reprobates in the house of God. Everything was corrupt. Men had bored the offering of the Lord at that time, the Bible says. And the lamp of God is being neglected. The house of God is being neglected. It's not being... Uh, kept up. And we can't really fault Samuel, of course, in this story because he's very young. He's probably still just a boy. You know, he probably couldn't even, maybe even reach that lamp. Who knows, you know, maybe he just couldn't be, you know, I don't know at what age you trust a child with an open flame, right? I don't know. But uh, we, could, we really can't really fault him, of course. But uh, Eli, you know, he's too old. He can't see. And his sons, you know, they're reprobate. But uh, so that's where we kind of see the spiritual state of Israel at this time. And of course, you know, it ends better towards the, the end of the chapter there. But the ver let's, go, let's move on here in the story. And it says in verse 4, the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here am I. So what I want to focus on tonight is this model salvation that we see in 2 Samuel or 1 Samuel chapter 3. I believe Samuel, this is Samuel's salvation that we read about. Because it says very specifically, we'll see in a minute, we read it already, that he says he knew not, he did not yet know the Lord and it had not been revealed to him. So I believe what we're reading about is the time, is the time when Samuel actually got saved. And we can look to Samuel's salvation here and we'll see a lot of parallels, I believe, tonight that parallel the salvation that we've seen today. Because it's Jesus Christ yesterday, today, and forever. Salvation's always been the same. It's always been by grace through faith, and it's always required certain elements. It's always required a preacher. It's always required the Spirit of God, and it's always required faith, believing, and calling upon the name of the Lord. So let's look at, at this real quick. So the first thing we see is it says, The Lord called and Samuel called Samuel, and he answered. So, you know, right out of the gate, you know, there goes your Calvinism. Okay? The sinner has to respond. It's not, God's not just going to magically, you know, uh, just make somebody get saved. You know, he called, yes, he does call, but he calls everyone. He lighteth every man that cometh to the world. You know, he died for the sins of the whole world. He's not willing that any should perish. He's the savior of all men, especially of those that believe, right? <laughs> but it, what we want to focus on there, it says, and he answered. You know, there has to be a reply from the sinner to the call of the Lord. So the Lord calls, but the sinner must respond to that call. You know, we see it all the time. We go out and knock doors and preach the gospel. Some people respond, and some people don't. 
Some people, they'll even let you go through the whole plan of salvation through the Bible. You'll read it to them, explain everything, and they'll still say, I don't believe that. Right. So the, the, the sinner has to respond to God's call or the gospel. Uh, and this is biblical. You know, Go over to John chapter 6. This is something that goes on today. This is a principle that's throughout Scripture. John, John 6, look at verse 44. It's a very familiar passage. But it's also the truth. He says, John 6, verse 44, No man come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So there has to be a calling from the Lord for somebody to get saved. Amen. If God's not working in somebody's heart, if there's not God calling them to that salvation, you know, God has to do his part too. He has to be there ministering to their heart. That's what he's saying here. No man can come to me except the Father draw him. Now, people will run with that and say, you know, God only calls some people. But Jesus said in John 12, if I be lifted up for the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Right. Now, go back to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. So, first of all, we see the Lord called and he answered. God calling the sinner and the sinner responding to salvation. God's not just going to make people get saved. And he says in verse 5, and he ran unto Eli and said, here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down, and the Lord called yet again. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for, I, for uh, thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. So Samuel's not putting together quite yet. you know. And what we see here, well, I think this is just a good principle that we can understand as soul winners, is that not everyone's going to get it the first time. Don't be just so quick to label somebody, you know, cast someone into hell permanently and just say, well, they're reprobate because... You know, I, I went up to some total stranger's door, you know, when they weren't expecting me and knocked on their door and offered to preach them the gospel and they rejected. And they said no. So obviously, they're never going to get saved. You know, well, hopefully we get all these door knocked and we can get back and knock their door again. Amen. Hopefully somebody else comes along and preaches them the gospel. Maybe, you know, you give them a verse. Maybe they'll have, uh, you know, they'll, they'll find something online. They'll hear the gospel somewhere else. You know, it took Samuel more than one, one, more than one shot, didn't it? Samuel didn't get it the first time. He didn't hear that and go, oh, this is the Lord speaking. I better listen up. You know, he didn't even know who it was. And he had to, he had to run and he said, no, I, I didn't call you. Uh, go lay it on again. So not everyone gets it the first time. Now look at verse 7. He says, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. I don't believe he was saved. This is his salvation. Verse 8, and the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So it takes three times of him calling him to kind of get this. But there's another element that has to be present. It's not just enough for the Lord to call people, just for enough for the Lord to you know, uh, work in people's hearts, get people to think about spiritual things. There also has to, we also have to do our part as man. We also have to do our part as soul winners to see people get saved. God's not just going to save everyone on His own. God uses men and women, boys and girls, He uses us to go out and see people get saved. And people, you know, they'll ridicule us and criticize and say, how can you say we got somebody saved? You know, sometimes we'll go knock doors, we'll get someone saved, we'll come back and say, hey, I got somebody saved. Well, who do you think you are to say you got somebody saved? Jesus is the one that died for him. Yeah, he did, but he used me to go preach his word and I got them saved. <clears throat> and there's nothing wrong with saying that. It's the truth. <clears throat> but it needs, a preacher is needed to preach the gospel. I'm not saying a preacher like a guy like me who stands up and preaches. I'm saying all of us can go out and preach the gospel as we're commanded to do. But a preacher is needed to instruct. It says in, uh, I should have had you keep something, John, but if you would, go back to uh, 6. Go back to John 6. And he says, and I'll read to you from verse 8, And the Lord called on Samuel again the third time, and he rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst called me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. So Eli figures it out. He's saying, first he's going, what, did this kid eat some bad pizza before bed or something? Or is he having a nightmare or what? You know, is this just a tree branch scraping the window? You know, it's a dog barking. No one's calling you. No, he figured it out. He's saying, wait, this kid keeps coming back. He's hearing somebody call him by name. He says that he perceived that it, the Lord had called the child. You know, and again, this kind of, I don't want to come across I'm sticking up for Eli all the time, but I mean, at least the guy had enough spirituality to see what was going on here and tell him what to do. You know, despite all of his shortcomings, which were severe. <clears throat> but a, well, the point being is a preacher is needed to instruct the person. Yes, God's calling him, 
Yes, God's calling Samuel, saying his name, you know, working on his heart, you know, calling them to repentance, calling them to salvation, wanting them to hear the gospel and understand. You know, peop, God can work in people's hearts, but unless somebody comes and preaches them the gospel and opens up the Bible and instructs them, they're not going to get saved. Otherwise, why does God need us? Why, why doesn't God just get everyone saved then if he doesn't use us to do it? <clears throat> the Bible says in John 6, 45, it is, uh, it is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. He says, every man that hears and has learned of the Father. Notice he said has learned of the Father, not learned from the Father. Somebody else telling them about who God is and who they are and how to get saved. <clears throat> Go over to Romans chapter 10. Look, a preacher is needed to preach the gospel. People will not get saved if we don't preach the gospel. Amen. The Bible says, and you're going to 1 Corinthians, or Romans 10, it says in 1 Corinthians 5, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos by, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? The Bible says that every person that believed was given a minister by whom they believed. Everybody had somebody come and preach the gospel to them. Whether it was they came to their door, whether it was somebody in their personal life that showed them, whether they saw the gospel on the, on the internet or on TV or somewhere, somebody, everybody that's believed by the Lord Jesus Christ has had somebody come and preach them the gospel in one shape or form or another. Everybody. Look here in Romans chapter 10. I'll prove it to you. He says in verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on them whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? He's saying, look, if nobody preaches, they're not going to hear. And if they don't hear, they're not going to believe. They're not going to get saved. They're not going to call on the name of the Lord. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says in Acts 8, And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understand what thou readest. Of course, is the famous story about the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, he's, he's coming back from Jerusalem, and he's reading in Isaiah, and, and the Holy Spirit tells Philip to run thither to join himself to that chariot, and he hears him reading, and he says, Understand what you're reading? The guy's got the Bible open, and he's reading it. He's reading in Isaiah, the prophet, and he's... And you know, uh, Philip runs over and he says, "You know, hey, do you know what you're reading? You understand what you read? Understand what thou readest? What, what did the Ethiopian eunuch say? Yeah, I got this. Makes perfect sense. I'm just about to get saved right now on my own. Thanks, but no thanks. I, I appreciate your effort, but you know, you can go back to where you came from. No, he said, how can I except some man should guide me? Right. He's saying, I can't understand this. Someone needs to show me what this is saying. I don't understand. The Bible says that the, the, things, uh, the, 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 the carnal man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually discerned. That he can't know them. That it takes somebody who has the Spirit of God, another believer, to come and show them what the Bible actually says, to preach them the Word. He said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where you are. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in the Christ in, uh, uh, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing our trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You know, God, it's true Jesus died for everybody and that he's reconciling the world to himself but he's committed that ministry unto us. What's that ministry? Of telling people that, that, that Christ will save them if they'll believe and call upon the name of the Lord. That's what he says in verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. How is God beseeching these people? By us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Look, we're in Christ's stead when we go out and preach the gospel. You're an ambassador for Christ, he says. And you're going out and you're telling people, be reconciled to God. Hey, you're a sinner. You're on the way to hell. But Jesus is God and he died for your sins and was buried and rose again. And that's the gist of the message, right? And when we preach that, you know, don't ever get in a rut where you just feel like, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just doing this. I mean, obviously, if you have to drag your carcass out there and get it done, do it. But 
that should not be how we just go through our, our life as Christians, just dragging ourselves from one soul winning time to another. You know, when you're out there preaching the gospel, understand that what you're doing is incredibly important. That you are in Christ's stead. That Jesus is saying, look, I'm, I came down there and I did all the hard work. All I'm asking you is go in my place now and just tell them about me. Amen. He's not saying, hey, why don't you go live a perfect life and die on the cross for the sins of the world? Because you can't do that, first of all. No one can. Right. But he's not asking us to do that. He's already done all that. All he's asking us is, hey, will you just go and tell them about me? And I'll go with you in spirit. I'll even go there and minister with you while you're talking to them. And I'll even give you the words to say. I'll even give you the Bible and the verses to preach to them and tell them. And that will be the power is. I just need you to go and be an ambassador and, send my, and bring my message to these people. Look, everyone needs a preacher to get saved. Everybody. And that's why, you know, there's a lot of very faulty methods out there that are, you know, under the umbrella of soul winning. You know, these tract ministries. And listen, I've stood out on corners for hours and handed out gospel tracts and seen nobody saved. I'm saying hours. Hours and hours and hours. You know, and where I'm in Traverse City, where I'm from in Michigan, they have the, the annual cherry festival where just millions of people come through this little town in the course of a week. And uh, we stand out there and we would just have stacks of these, these Bible tracts. And just people walking by and you just hand them, here you go. Here you go. Read it. Read it. It's not going to do any good, folks. Right. I remember before I got saved, someone left a gospel track laying around. I picked it up and I read it and I was like, what? <laughs> right. And it was just about how Jesus died for my sins. And if I believe in him, I can go to heaven. I didn't understand it. I couldn't get it. I was like, I don't understand. Why do I need a, why do I need a Savior? It wasn't until somebody actually sat down with me and opened up the book and explained it to me and preached it to me that I got saved. <coughs> so... You know, that's, that's why what we do as soul winners is so important. You know, and we shouldn't fall for these cheap substitutes and let those replace soul winning because that's not effective. And you say, well, maybe somebody does get saved. Maybe it, maybe it helps. You know, that's, yeah, maybe it does, but is it the most effective way? I mean, what's, what's the most effective way to go out and be an ambassador? I mean, do you think the United States hires an ambassador and just says, yeah, just send emails? You know, you can just stay here in the U.S. in Washington and just email your respective country. No, they send them out there. They say, you need to go over there, go to the embassy, get to know people, rub elbows with them, talk to them, tell them about our policies, you know, negotiate with them, so on and so forth. They, they put them out in the trenches, and they got to get their hands dirty. They got to, you know, they got to get in there and do it. And that's the way it is with us. You know, you can't just have this online ministry. You know, you got to go out there. You know, people get in, the, they want to get in chat boards and forums and things like that. Well, I'm just going to do all my witnessing online. Hey, good luck with that. All you're going to end up is just chasing your tail and getting in arguments with people. <coughs> the best way to get somebody saved is just go out and knock on their door and just confront them with the gospel. Ask them, hey, can I show you? Well, the worst they can do is say no. And it's on to the next one until you find somebody who's willing to listen and will get saved. <coughs> But the point is tonight, what we see from Samuel's salvation is that it requires a preacher. Yes, God calls, and the sinner has to respond. Samuel had to get up and get out of bed and try to figure out what's going on here. But it took, it took Eli to perceive what was going on and to tell him what to do. And what were Eli's instructions? Again, keep something in John. We're going to come right back. I'd probably turn you somewhere else, but go to John, keep something there. I know you're in the New Testament right now anyway. So keep something in John and go back where you were. So Eli, he perceives what's going on, and then he begins to give instructions to, to Samuel. And I believe we can learn some things about, we can see what, what is involved in somebody getting saved. It says in verse 9, therefore, uh, Eli, therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak. Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went down and went and lay down in his place. So what's the first thing he's doing? He tells people the same thing, basically. Not, not, doesn't just, I mean, it's there, but it's not just black and white. But he's telling him to believe, if you see this. He's saying, look, when you go there, say, speak what? Lord. Call him Lord. You know, he's saying believe, right? That's why we tell him, hey, do you believe that Jesus is God? He believed that he's the Lord, right? He's saying, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. 
right? And I believe that's, you know, we can look at that as, you know, that's him telling them to believe. You know, the equivalent of us today would be like, you know, believe on the Lord. <coughs> Why would you speak to somebody you don't believe in? <laughs> right? So he says, in, look, look where you are in John chapter 3. These are very familiar passages. But that's what it takes to get saved, isn't it? To believe. Now look, everybody that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ is saved. If somebody believes on the Lord, they're saved. If they believe that Jesus is God, that he died for their sins, was buried and rose again the third day, they're saved. Amen. That's the gospel. That's the simplicity which is in Christ. And that's what the Bible says over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. We'll look at a few verses. We know John 3, right? John 3, 15. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17. For God sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Go to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, the Bible says in John 5, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Go over to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Bible says in John 6, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Acts chapter 10, go to verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Look, it's just over and over again. Whosoever believeth. Whosoever believeth. He that believeth. Anyone that believes. And notice that was the only thing they had to do. Wasn't believe in good life, live a good life, believe and go to church, believe and be baptized, believe and keep the commandments, believe and you know uh, keep the sacraments, believe and do this, believe and do that. All these things that we that man tries to work into his own salvation, which is nothing but work. <clears throat> he says he says it's by grace through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Look, if you're relying at all on your own good life to go to heaven, you're not going to go. Amen. It has to be all on Jesus. All of it. Whosoever believeth puts all their trust in him. That's what believe means. <coughs> Go over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. He said in Romans 1, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to everyone that believeth. If someone believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're saved, period. That's it. To the Jew first and also the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith, not by works. Romans 4, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And what do you hear all the time out when you ask people if they know for sure they're going to go to heaven? How do they know they're going to heaven? I lived a good life. I've been a good person. Look, I understand that, that people, they probably are good people, but in the light of Scripture, that's probably one of the most proudest, arrogant statements there are. Why should I, I mean, can you imagine standing before a holy God and say, why, him saying, why should I let you into, into heaven, which is perfect? Which, you know, nothing that maketh a lie can enter in. No sin can come in here. Why should I let you in? Because I lived a good life. You think that's, and God's going, oh, really? Well, what about the time you did this? What time you did this? What about the time you thought this? What about the time you said this? Oh, I forgot about that. So our good works aren't going to get us in there. That's, I mean, if, if our good works are going to get us in there, why did Jesus even come here? Why, is he, why did he even have to come and live a perfect life and die for our sins and, and do all that hard work for us? Look, it's just belief. <coughs> so he said, Eli, if you notice there, he says, first of all, he said, speak Lord. He's saying you've got to call him Lord. Believe it's God. That's, what, uh, that's the application I'm trying to make tonight. You know, he's telling Eli to believe. Now, do, do you think it was very hard for Eli to believe? I mean, he's in the temple or the tabernacle. You know, he's serving the Lord. Obviously, he probably, you know, it wasn't a big deal for him to, to, to believe on the Lord. But he had, to, he had to come to a place in his life where, you know, he had to make that decision for himself to believe, you know. And, you know, that's a message for all the kids tonight. You got to be like Samuel. 
at some point, you know, this faith has to be your own. You know, you're not going to go to heaven on mom and dad's faith. You're going to go to heaven because you believed. Why should I let you into heaven? Because my mom and dad believed. That ain't going to work. You, know, you have to believe personally. Like Samuel. Right? But notice he says, um, he said, uh, he said if, if he call thee, thou shalt say. Right? And back in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 9. Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and if it be, if he call thee, thou shalt say. So he's telling him, use your mouth. You're going to respond to God. Okay? He said, Speak, Lord. He said, Thou shalt say. Now look, everyone that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is saved. But the Bible is very clear that you have to call upon the name of the Lord. That if, 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 you, if, you, know, uh, if, if you believe in your heart and call upon the name of the Lord and, and confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, thou shalt be saved. That's what the Bible says. And that's Scripture. That's all throughout the Bible. Okay? Genesis, I mean, we go all the way back to Genesis 4 where it says, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, where back then in the time of, of uh, Adam, you know, at the very beginning, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. This is something that's been going on since the garden, you know, not the garden, but all the way back in Genesis. You're there in Romans 8. Look at verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So you have to believe and you have to confess with your mouth, right? For with the heart of man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all them that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we understand that if you believe, you're saved. But there's also this element that you have to call upon the name of the Lord. <clears throat> Go over to John chapter 4. I keep forgetting to tell you to stay there. You might want to. That's, this is probably the last time I'm going there. I don't know. I, could, I guess I could look ahead. John chapter 4, verse 10. The famous story when Jesus you know, goes to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, who it is that giveth thee, uh, saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. I think this is very important to understand that he's saying, look, if you knew who I was and the gift that I have to give you, you would ask for it. That's what he's saying here, right? Look at it again. He said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God, what's the gift of God today? Eternal life, going to heaven. It is the gift of God, not of works, right? <coughs> who it is that, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou would have asked him. He's saying, look, if you knew who I was and you believed, you would ask. And this is where I think people get confused. Is they think that it's possible for you to believe and not ask for it. If you believe, you're going to ask for it. Whether you do that with your mouth or in your heart. And then you, know, then you have some people get real dogmatic on this belief. They say, well, if you don't actually verbalize the words, then, you're, then you didn't get saved. Now, I don't believe that. I believe that you should you know, pray. And we instruct people to pray. It's a good thing to do. But look, if you, if you hear the gospel, it's preached to you, and you have a clear understanding and you believe it, you are going to respond to the Lord. Whether that's with your mouth or in your heart, in some way, shape, or form, you're going to do that. And if that's, that's just a fact of the matter. I believe that. Who in the world is going to believe that and not, and not call upon the name of the Lord? You know, the best, the best way to, to, to explain this is, you know, to, to use the analogy of, um, you know, <laughs> can I get a couple brave volunteers? This is the best way I've seen it done. We need some brave volunteers tonight. No, All right. Either one. Whoever, I said brave. So if you're brave. <laughs> All right. So Brother Matt here, why don't you come stand over here? Brother Matt. Brother Matt's going to stand right here. I'm going to give you a stand right here. Brother Matt here, you know, I'm just going to use an uh, example that I heard elsewhere, and I think it does this very well. Brother Matt here has, you know, stage four cancer. No, this is this is not really folks. I'm just this is okay. Calm down. So he he's I mean he's gonna die. And he's been trying everything, right? He's been doing the chemo, he's been doing the radiation, he's been 
you know, everything that they've been telling him to do, he's been doing. Now, <coughs> Brother Gabriel here is this cutting edge doctor, right? He's, 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 he's got this, and he's got this new treatment that is 100% effective, cures cancer 100% of the time. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, th but th in order for this to work, Brother Matt has to give up all of these other treatments. He has to completely trust in only Brother Gabriel's treatment. <coughs> so, you know, I, I would go to Brother Matt and I would say, hey, do you, uh, do you want to get cancer free? Yes. Okay, do you, do, you, sure. do you believe that Brother Gabriel's got this treatment that's 100% effective? I do. Yeah. So there's really only one thing left to do, isn't there? Right. Yep. Gabriel, please. <laughs> See, <laughs> please, there you go. Please <laughs> right? <please be. laughs> wouldn't it just be, uh, wouldn't it be weird for me to just sit here and be like, right. And they're just like, okay, well, there, you know. <laughs> and Matt being, hey, I want this treatment. Give it to me. He wants it, but he just is like, oh, well, I'm glad you have that. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> and just walk away from that. <laughs> I don't want to die, but, I, you know, I'm not going to ask for it. You guys must sit down. Thanks. You know, hopefully that's a good enough, I did a good enough job. But look, if somebody has something that you believe, then you want, you're going to ask for it. Why wouldn't you ask for it? <coughs> I mean, let's look at some examples of people calling upon the name of the Lord. To me, that verse in John 4 just is crystal clear that if, if, you, be if you believe, you will ask. <coughs> but let's look at some ways people call upon the name of the Lord because some people get real dogmatic about this too. Like if you don't get down on your knees, now is it both knees or just one knee? You know, which knee is it? You know, and you don't pray, well, what exactly should I say? You want to turn in a Pharisee over this. And, and this thing, this keeps popping up its head. Like, I, I, ever since I've been coming to church here, we've probably, I've probably seen this thing get dealt with three or four, maybe even five times. And this constantly, just every so often, it comes up and it comes up and it comes up. And it's usually from somebody who just wants to, you know, do some vein jangling and just wants to just throw it out there and just to, or it's somebody who's just hardcore trolling. They already know the answer and they just, they're just trying to like stir things up. And people get mixed up on it. But to me, it seems so simple. It just seems so crystal clear that if a person believes on the Lord, they're going to ask to get saved. <clears throat> the question of can somebody believe and not ask is, is a hypothetical that doesn't even happen in my book. And so there's no point even going down that, that, that rabbit trail with, with folks. Go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. The Bible says in 1 John 4, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. The Bible says in Acts chapter 8, verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth, and of course, uh, you know, he's, he's preaching here to the Ethiopian eunuch, again, going back to that. Remember the guy who said, I can't understand except some man should show me? And it says in, in verse 35, And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, so he's using the word of God and he's showing him and preached unto him Jesus. So we see again, you need a preacher, right? And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He's saying, look, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can get baptized. Now, does, so what that's showing us, and I don't want to go off on baptism, but it shows us that baptism comes after you get believe, after you believe. That baptism is not necessary for salvation. And there's a lot of churches out there, they want to baptize people that, you know, the, the Catholics want to baptize babies to take away sin. That's not in the Bible. You never see an infant getting baptized in Scripture, ever. It's always an adult who has believed on the Lord. What did Philip tell him? He said, if thou believest, thou mayest. He's saying, look, what doth hinder me? What's stopping me from being baptized? If thou believest, thou mayest. Babies can't believe, friend. Babies don't, they can't even, they're trying to figure out what their hands are, right. you know, <laughs> let alone like the, you know, the greatest questions in life. Wh who am I? Where did I come from? Where do I go when I die? Who's God? You know, babies aren't thinking along those lines. <coughs> Adults think like that. You know, people who have come to a certain level of maturity, young children think like that. So, but I don't want to go on about baptism, but he's saying, look, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. You know, and some churches will teach you, you know, like Church of Christ, I think it is. You know, they, they teach you that you have to get baptized. Even as an adult, that if you don't get dunked, 
Do they dunk or they sprinkle? Dunk. They dunk? At least they got that part of it right. But they think it's necessary for you to, in order to go to heaven. Look, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, how many verses did we just read where he said, if thou believest? Did he say anything about baptism? No. In any of those verses? So if you get to heaven, if you believe on the Lord and you get there and God says, yeah, but did you get baptized? No, well then you can't come in. Then God's a liar. Yeah. Because he said it over and over again. And we know that God cannot lie. Okay. <coughs> anyway, he says, and he so what was his response? When he said, look, here's water, what doth hinder me? He said, if thou believest, thou mayest. So how did he respond? He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both in the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. I mean, that was good enough for Philip. He heard one sentence. Now let's count the syllables. No, I'm just kidding. You know, <laughs> but he, he heard one, him say one thing. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And to Philip's mind, he's saying, well, you must, you're saved. Because you know, he just preached in the gospel. So that response there was good enough for him. So there's one example of somebody calling upon the name of the Lord. You know, Philip didn't say, whoa, 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 you didn't say it just right. You know, whoa, whoa, let's stop the chariot. Let's get down here on our knees. You know, put your hand on my Bible. You know, put your hand right here and then we'll pray. You know, look, and if you do that, I'm fine. I don't have a problem with that. But I'm just saying, people get carried away and they think, well, if they don't do it, if they don't say these exact words, or if they, if, they, if they don't say anything, if they just say it in their heart, that you know what I mean? It, it, they just go overboard with this. <coughs> and you know what? Even very poorly worded prayers count. Go over to Luke chapter 3, or 23. Let's look at a very poorly worded prayer of salvation. And you can't really blame the guy. He's kind of under duress here, you know, the thief on the cross. He probably didn't have his wits about him, you know, when you're being crucified. Look at verse 39. It says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the ans other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. According to Roman law, by the way, that's not b biblical punishment. You know, they were, they were, they were uh, thieves. They, they had stolen. The Bible does not prescribe the death penalty for stealing. So he's kind of off on that already. We indeed justly receive the due reward for our deeds. No, not according to the Bible. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, what did he say to him? Lord. Call him Lord, right? You know, you got to, whosoever shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Right? Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That's him confessing the Lord Jesus Christ with his mouth. Amen. That's a prayer of salvation. That man got saved right there. And notice there was no baptism involved. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I mean, is that an exact answer to his prayer? It's not. Because if he had remembered him when he came into his kingdom, that guy would have been waiting around in hell for a while. Yeah. He would have been waiting around in the grave. But Jesus knew what he meant, right? So he said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Amen. You're going to go to heaven today and be with the Lord. Because of your belief and you've confessed. And why did he confess, Lord? Because he believed. It just came naturally. <coughs> and I believe this also, and if you would, go back to 1 Samuel. You might have caught this two weeks ago or, the, or two chapters ago in, in chapter 1. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 1. You know, prayers can be whatever comes from the heart. As long as it's in faith, somebody calling upon the name of the Lord. It can be even a very poorly worded prayer that you don't really know what you're saying. <laughs> Like, yeah, when you get to me, Lord, you know, remember me. You know, when you come back to set up your millennial reign, go, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember you. He say, no, today, right? He, God just took that prayer and interpreted it the right way and said, this guy just wants to be saved. And he's calling upon me. He's saved. <coughs> I believe that praying or calling upon the name of the Lord is something that can be done inwardly. It's not even something you have to do out loud. <laughs> Hopefully I don't get, you know, ran out of tail on a rail on the internet somewhere <laughs> for saying that. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12, And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord. Samuel's mom, Hannah, is praying before the Lord. The Bible, this is the narrator of the Bible talking, telling us what happened. And Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. 
So she's speaking in her heart, and her lips are moving, but there's no voice. But the Bible says she's praying Amen. and calls it a prayer. So I believe that if a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, even if it's inwardly, some way they are going to respond to the Lord. And that's calling upon the name of the Lord in my book. And I believe that's biblical and that person is saved. <clears throat> and I believe calling upon the name of the Lord can be done privately. I mean, isn't, exact, isn't that exactly what's going on with Samuel in our story? Go back there to 1 Samuel chapter 3. And the Lord came, verse 10, and the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. He didn't run and get Eli like, oh, you got to hear this. So, you know, later I can confirm my salvation to everybody else that's going to question it. No, he did it privately. <clears throat> he said, speak for thy servant here. I believe prayer can be done in private. You know, and that's why we shouldn't just, you know, give up on people that maybe you, you go through the whole plan of salvation at the door with somebody and, it's, and they believe it, but they don't want to pray. You know, pray that that person goes inside and, and calls upon the name of the Lord. I mean, I try to do what I can to get people to pray at that moment. You know, and I think that's important to do. They need to, they need to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, if they refuse to do it right then and there, there's still a chance that they could go back inside that door, maybe later that afternoon, later that evening, the next day, next week, they could be thinking about what we talked about, thinking about what we talked about, and they might just come to a place where in their heart, privately, while they're doing the dishes, or they're taking a shower, or they're driving the car, or whatever they're doing, you could just say, Lord, I believe. And that person's saved because they just called upon the name of the Lord yep. in their heart. <laughs> and I believe they will, too, that if a person really, believe, really, truly, honestly believes in the Lord, they are going to respond, even if it's not with us. Look, I believe there's going to be a lot of people that when we get to heaven that we spoke to that, we, that, that listened to the whole thing and... and and, then, and we, we didn't pray with them, that later, that later prayed. And God said, I believe that's going to happen. You know what else? I think there's a lot of people that we, we prayed with that said they believed that didn't. And we're going to be going, well, where are they? It's going to be both. <clears throat> so I believe this is a great example here in 1 Samuel chapter 3 of somebody getting saved. You have the Lord, you know, working on Samuel's heart, calling him by name, ministering to his heart. You know, it's like the Holy Spirit coming and ministering to us. You know, convincing us of sin, reproving us, getting us to think of spiritual things. The Holy Spirit plays his part today too. I believe that. And then you have a, a man of God, somebody who, who is saved and knows the Lord, giving instructions on what to do. Believe and speak and reply. And then you have somebody doing that, praying privately by themselves to the Lord, confessing their faith. <clears throat> I mean, look how he refers to himself. He refers to himself as his servant. That's him calling him Lord. Because the Lord is a boss. So if I'm calling myself your, your servant, I'm basically calling you Lord. <coughs> that's his, that is his answer. His reply, his confession to God. I believe that's the moment he got saved. So, you know, that's the main thing that I wanted to preach about tonight. Because I think that's an important doctrine. And, you know, that's, that's a doctrine that could probably be preached on in another sermon at another time. But it was here. You know, it's here in this chapter. But let's go on to verse 11. He says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Now you know it's serious when both ears are going to tingle. Right? That always catches me off guard. Everything. He says, Both the ears of everyone that heareth it. Not just one ear. This is serious business. <laughs> you know? Both the ears are going to tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all the things which I have concerning his house. Remember what he had said in previous chapters that both his sons should die in one day? And that he was going to remove his, his, uh, his future generations from the priesthood so that one would come and beg for a piece of, piece of bread. <coughs> he said, when I begin, I will also make an end. What, he's, what is he saying here when he says, I, when I begin, I will make an end? He's like, no one's going to change my mind about it. It's too late for Eli and his house. It's going to happen. He's saying, I'm not going to repent. I'm going, when I begin, I'm going to make an end. It's going to happen. Right? He says, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. He's saying, look, he knows why I'm going to do what I'm going to do. He's fully, well, he's fully aware. And what was the big... Why was Eli about to get judged? Why was God bringing the smack down on Eli here? Because his sons made themselves vile. Remember how they were taking the offering? They were, they were uh, forcing uh, 
the, the people to give the meat, that they were taking the, the, the fat and they were burning and they were taking the, the, the offering that was supposed to be roast on the Lord and they were eating that. They were taking the sodden flesh from the people's portion. Then they were laying with every woman that came to the door of the tabernacle. They were committing fornication. And it says that they were sons of Beelzebub. So they're wicked guys. He says, he says, because his sons made themselves vile. So all those things that they did, the Bible calls vile. <coughs> And he restrained them not. That was Eli's sin. He restrained them not. Now, if you recall, Eli does rebuke his sons in the previous chapter. He says, It is no good thing that I hear of thee. Thou makest the people to transgress. If one man sinneth against the Lord, uh, the judge will intercede. But if, a, or if one man sin against another, the judge will, will, uh, will intercede. But if, one man, if a man sin against the Lord, you know, who can tell? So he did kind of rebuke his sons, and I believe it was a, a harsh rebuke, but was that enough? No, it wasn't. He did not restrain them. He didn't say his sons made them files and he rebuked them not. Look, there's a time for words and then there's a time for action. And at that point, Eli should have just realized what was going on and carried out the biblical punishment for those two, those two men, which was stoning. And we looked at that in Deuteronomy, that if... if, if if they hearken not unto their father and mother and their gluttons and drunkards, they were to take them to the men, the men of the city and the city of uh, the gates, and they were to stone them with stones that they die. That's what he should have done. He should have restrained them. Not just, you know, look, th the words should have come much earlier. You know, Eli should have been rebuking and chastening and teaching and instructing his sons much earlier in their life. Maybe they would have turned out the way they did. But it was to the point now where there's only one thing left to do. Restrain them. Stop them from doing what they're doing. Because there's no stopping, they're, you know, they're not gonna, they're not going to be placated with words, just like a reprobate in Romans chapter one. They're implacable. You can't negotiate with them. You can't, you can't work things out. They have to be restrained. They have to be stopped. <clears throat> so the problem with Eli is not what his sons did, but that he didn't do anything about it. And his, you know, his rebuke was not the proper response. Now look there in verse fourteen. It says. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Now, I always love this end, ending here. I mean, when you just think about, you know, when you just think about Samuel and this whole experience they just went through, it's really, really something. To think about this little, this boy, right, hearing this voice, and hearing God call him by name verbally. I mean, sometimes you read that and it gives you chills. Samuel. Samuel. You know, it's, it's amazing to me. And, but notice it says there, he lay until the morning. It doesn't say he went back to bed. I don't think after experience like that, you're just going to go, oh, that was nice. <laughs> you know, you're not just going to surf YouTube for a little while and then fall asleep. <laughs> so I think Samuel laid there all night just like, wow. I'm saved. The Lord spoke to me. I mean, it's amazing. Yep. And I believe, you know, in this, and remember when we started out, we were talking about what a, what a, the, the darkness, the, the spiritual darkness that had crept in and the poor uh, uh, state of affairs that they were in spiritually. But now you see the hope starting to come. Eli, or, uh, Samuel gets saved, right? And he lay until the morning and he gets up. I mean, and he opened the, do the doors of the house of the Lord. So when, you know, the, the dawn's just coming up, this is how I envision it. Like the sun's coming up, you know, the, the dew's on the grass. It's a fresh morning and he walks out and it's like a new day's dawning, right? He goes to the house of the Lord in the morning and he opens the doors and he lets that light come back into the house of God where it, where it had gone dark. You know, the day before the light had snuffed out. There was no light in the house of the Lord. But now God is raising up an, a, new, a new man of God and you have this kind of this new dawning. Right, him opening the doors, the sun coming in. It's a very, you know, it's a great picture of hope here at the end of this chapter. You know, when you start to read First Samuel, you're like, man, this is rough. You know, sons of Belial in the house of God. People are boring the house of the Lord. Every man's doing that which is right in his own eyes. All this wickedness and vileness. And the man of God's old and weak. He can't do anything about it. God's judging him. But then you have this beautiful picture at the end of this, this boy getting saved and be, you know the man that's going to go on and become this great man of God, and he goes to the house. I mean, what a walk that must have been when he's walking the house of the Lord and opening up those doors. 
And then, of course, Eli comes along. I, I wonder if Eli maybe had stayed up a little bit that night, too. Maybe he was kind of like, hey, what did he say to you, huh? And he was probably sweating that. And he says in verse 16, well, look, we'll look there. He, gets, he, he goes to the house of the Lord and it says, and Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. You know, he was like, this isn't, Eli's, you know, this is bad news. It's hard to give people bad news, isn't it? I'm like, you're not going to like what I have to say. You know, some people, sometimes people come to you like, hey, can you give me some advice in this situation? And they email the church, and they're like, hey, this is what I got going on. You got any counsel? Sometimes it's just like, yeah, archive. <laughs> you know, you're not going to want to hear it anyway. <coughs> but you know, he says uh, in verse 16, Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, answered, here am I. And he said, what is the thing that the Lord has said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God, do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. And this is what I love about Samuel. This is how you know he's going to be a good preacher. And Samuel told him every wit. Do you think he stopped being afraid? I don't, it doesn't say, and, and, you know, and he received boldness and courage. Right. He was afraid to say what he had to say. But you know what? He didn't let his fear stop him. He went and said, I'm going to tell you every wit. Oh, you want to hear it? Here you go. Amen. And hid nothing from him. And that's the kind of preacher that we need. That's the kind of preachers that we need. And anyone that endeavors or desires to be a preacher one day and preach the word of God has to have this mentality of not being, a, even when they are afraid, of not holding back. Look, I'm not going to get up here and lie and say, well, I'm never, I know that if I preach this or say this, there's a good chance that somebody might get upset. That's like every service. <laughs> I mean, there's, I mean every, there's so many offensive things to the, to the world today in the Word of God. You're not going to preach through the entire book of the Bible and not offend somebody. You stick around long enough, you know, eventually all I have to do is just keep preaching on it, preaching on it, preaching on it, everything out of this book. Eventually I'm going to land on your sin. Now I could get nervous about that and say, well, I don't want to, you know, if that'll be an uncomfortable situation. You know, what if they come up to me after service? And by the way, people come up to you after service. Let me just warn you. I used to hear preachers say that about, about they would they'd be telling they'd be preaching and saying, "Don't come to me after church after service tonight and start telling you know." I'd be like, "Do they really do that?" Because I'd never done that. I'd never gone up to preacher. At least I don't remember being like, "Hey, nice sermon, but you know, I didn't appreciate." And then remember, I, I one time I got up and preached a sermon that had a little bit of teeth in it, and sure enough, this guy comes right up to me afterwards. It's like good sermon, but you know, I didn't appreciate. And I'm just like they, and I'm like, oh. Okay, well, thanks. But then we're just like, get away from me, you jerk. <laughs> and then I could, I'm like, they're right. I can't believe it. They actually do do that. Right. <clears throat> but look, if, you're wanna, if you want to avoid that uncomfortable, you know, potentially that uncomfortable situation or s upsetting somebody out in the audience, the congregation, preaching is not for you. The last thing we need is somebody to get up here and start trimming the word of God and just tell everybody all the nice, soft, cute little things that they want to hear rather than just preaching all of it, telling people every wit and not holding back. That's what we need. And that's how you know Samuel is going to be a good preacher because he had the boldness to preach a negative message in spite of the fact that he was uncertain how it was going to turn out. He didn't know how Eli was going to take it. And of course, he says, you know, in verse uh, 18, and he said, it is the Lord, let him, seemeth do what, let him do what seemeth good. You know, Eli took it well as well as you could, I suppose, for receiving a message like that. And then it goes on, it says, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. Now, I don't think that's a coincidence, that you have Samuel telling him every wit, and then God honors that by saying, Well, I'm not going to let any of your words fall to the ground. God's with him. You know, God's going to be with the preacher that's going to preach the entire word of God. Say, I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll fill you with boldness, I'll let all of your words, your words are going to hit, they're going to hit home, they're going to help people, they're going to rebuke people, they're going to encourage people. It's going to work in the people of God that you preach to if you'll preach all of it. <clears throat> That's why he let none of his words fall to the ground because he was bold enough to tell people every wit. And it says in verse 20, And all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Going back to going and show, showing us again, that's how God revealed himself back then, was through men of God, through preachers, through prophets, that he would use them. So a great chapter. There's a lot here. You know, there's, every time I read, I love 1 Samuel, especially these, these opening chapters. 
you know, I love this chapter. It's probably one of my favorite chapters uh, out of the out of the, the word of, uh, the Old Testament here because of just the imagery and and, and the, the great examples of salvation. You go from the darkness to the light. You see Samuel being this bold preacher, you know, which is what we all need to be, you know. So let's end it with this. You know, we need to we need to be like Samuel. Not everyone's going to get up in a pulpit and, and have to you know be a bold preacher. You know, but we all have to have the boldness to go out there and preach the gospel. Because like we were seeing tonight, everybody needs a preacher. Every, no one's going to believe without somebody coming to them and preaching them the word of God. You know, in some shape or form. And we can't just sit back and, and, and let, you know, let the, the internet hopefully get them all. Because it's not going to happen. You know, not, every, it's not, not everybody's logging on to YouTube. You think they're looking up Bible Way to Heaven on their own? Probably not. They're probably looking up, you know, cat videos. You know, or they're looking up like squirrel obstacle courses or something, <laughs> which is a funny video. It's out there. But the point being, you know, we have to be the people that go out there and bring the gospel. We have to be, and that, you know what? That takes boldness. It takes boldness for us to go out there and tell people what? Every wit. Not just the part about, oh, God loves you, but also tell them about that God will send you to hell if you don't get saved. Because yep. that's a I mean, is that, that's a pretty negative message. I mean, I could get up here and preach a rip some face and preach a hard message, but is it any harder than any, the message that any of us would bring to somebody out there that says, hey, you're on your way to hell? That's the most negative thing you can tell anybody. Hey, you're on your, hell, you're on your way to hell right now, but God loves you and wants to save you. It's both. It's, it's light and dark. It's, it's negative and positive. So let's be like Samuel, all of us in that regard. You know, and the God, you know what? And in turn, God will be with us and let none of our words fall to the ground. And when we're preaching all of his counsel to the unsaved, let's go ahead and pray.